Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Futures Talks. I'm Diana Bogosian from Los Angeles, and along with Sina Mostafavi, we'll be representing the Digital Futures team and co-moderating uh, today's session called Immersive Robotics uh, Environments. Uh, today's session will uh, consist of a presentation in the beginning, which we will set up an overview of the topic, and then we will invite each of our panelists to then uh, follow up with their presentations before we engage uh, in a conversation together. So a little bit about my background and my interest uh, in this panel. I'm an assistant professor of architecture technology at Florida International University's Department of Architecture, and I'm also a PhD candidate in media arts and practice at University of Southern California's uh, School of Cinematic Arts. My research focuses on development of participatory immersive media for environmental issues. And I'm also an assistant uh, program director at Florida International uh, University's uh, Robotic and Digital Fabrication Lab, where I'm also focusing on development of immersive media for uh, teaching uh, robotics in uh, different uh, capacities. Sina, you are muted. Hi, I'm Sina Mustafavi, joining from TUDELF. I'm also uh, leading the DARS Hub at the Southern Institute of Architecture. And I'm also the co-founder of Southern Hub Architecture Studio. My main research interest is on uh, what I call hybrid intelligence in design to robotic production processes that lead to material and fabrication intelligence. Uh, and my particular interest in today's topic uh, is based on the potential we see in the application of immersive media to make uh, robotic materialization processes more intelligent, as I can exemplify in this recent work where we give a new type of agency to human by turning the captured personal data, in this case, our emotions while listening to music into data-driven robotic materialization workflow. So uh, with these two fields of interest, uh, together uh, with Biana, uh, we see uh, this panel as an intermediate session between uh, robotic uh, fabrication and AR, VR game session uh, to follow. Uh, therefore, beyond what can be done in terms of manufacturing or AR, VR applications, we are interested to know more about how such integration can happen and further why such efforts are relevant and contributing to the field of architectural robotics in particular, and beyond that, to the discipline of architecture and building industry in general. Moreover, also today's panel can be positioned within the context of Industry 4.0, which by benefiting from proliferation of automation and computation technologies, the focus is very much on cyber physical systems where hardware and software are highly intertwined. While such efforts could lead to uh, robotic fabrication, yet this is not only about fabrication, or it can also lead to explorations of VR, AR, or mixed reality, yet it is not only about these territories. So if we want to summarize the scope of this field, we will be looking at the relationships between user, media, machines, matters, and environments. And we are particularly interested to address how such interdisciplinary efforts can introduce new forms of intelligence in multiple levels and scales. To delve into, uh, 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 to delve more into uh, each of these elements, we have identified four categories through which we would like to frame the past and present of scholarly and technological research. The four categories are representation, simulation, adaptivity, and co-agency. So uh, let's start with representation, which is one of the fundamental pillars of architectural discourse and profession. Uh, in this case, our focus on representation is not only on information creation, uh, communication or layering, but also challenging one's perception and uh, triggering basically uh, creative design processes through which uh, various modes of engagement and embodiment could potentially be achieved. Next slide, please. So uh, for this, I would like to take you back for a moment to 1935 and talk about Stanley Weinbaum's uh, short sci-fi story about a magic uh, eyewear that allow characters to teleport between different worlds. 
Uh, this story is said to be the first description of a VR environment as we know it today. From uh, this magic glasses to a magic box, uh, where in 1956, cinematographer and inventor Morton Hillig created Sensorama, which was a machine which displayed stereoscopic footage that he had captured with his cameras. And these footage was accompanied by vibrations, wind and aroma, and um, more sensory triggers. And ultimately, Sensorama became this um, benchmark for a lot of in uh, inventors to follow up. And uh, this research was pretty much uh, inspired a series of inventors and more importantly, uh, and, I, and I think it's impossible to really discuss this topic without really talking about grand uh, breaking and pioneering work that was done by Ivan Sutherland and his uh, MIT group. So starting from his 1963 invention of Sketchpad, which was not only groundbreaking in computer graphics, but also laid a foundation for fields of human computer interaction, so XCI, as well as computer aided design or CAD, which had then became a very big component of our field in architecture. Inspired by Sensorama Sutherland and his colleague Bob Schrell created the first VR headset, which was so heavy that had to be tethered from the ceiling. But actually, this also allowed them to begin to think about uh, spatial computing and also situating the technology. Now, if we fast forward to today, many, many decades later, perhaps an application like Tiltbrush, which was released by Google, is an embodiment of what, what, what Sutherland uh, perhaps was envisioning with his sketch bag, uh, sketchpad and uh, spatial computing concepts that he was developing with his VR headset. And uh, in this case, a very user-friendly uh, application uh, becomes a way for the user to engage with this creation in different scales and through different viewpoints. And um, in the past decades, actually, some of the best examples that have begun to bridge this gap between digital and, and physical have come from uh, the field of cinema and media arts. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this example. Um, so this was a project called The Box by Bat and Dali, which was an experimental demonstration that used uh, industrial robots for large scale synchronized projection mapping. Um, what was interesting about this um, demo, which was released in 2013, uh, is the fact that it was released in the same year as Oculus Rift. And uh, we know that Oculus Rift really revolutionized the field of uh, VR in terms of beginning to think about democratization of technology. And these two uh, triggered a lot of interesting conversations about what could really immersive uh, robotic environments or immersive environments could become. Then um, our second topic here that we would like to put forward is this uh, concept of simulation. And um, any simulation would require uh, an abstraction of a concept or a process in order for you to then proceed to creating a computational model to do further studies. And uh, this idea of building uh, models are a very big part of, uh, let's say, uh, our uh, architectural um, education, right? So the fact that we constantly are uh, trained to build uh, digital and, and physical models. And often um, simulation in this uh, scale allows you to minimize errors and increase control over the final outcome. However, when you are beginning to tackle more com complex problems, such as um, this research here by um, Kohler and Gramatio team at ETH Zurich and the Autodesk um, research group, we're looking at employment of deep reinforcement learning to teach a robot how to do pretty um, tight, um, um, low to to tolerance lab joint timber beams based on uh, contact forces. Uh, that were sensed uh, by the robots. So the role of simulation in this game became more than just, um, let's say, avoiding errors. It became a way for the model to begin uh, data and continue to train um, its and grow its own database for it to achieve, let's say, intelligent. Now, uh, going forward, another important concept here that we want to put forward under this umbrella of simulation is uh, this idea of a digital twin, which refers to a, a virtual replica of a physical product or an asset that is updated in real time. So this is an important concept 
as it would result in an efficient uh, and possibly remotely accessed systems and models and data. And this feature is extremely important, especially uh, these days that we're dealing with a global pandemic and, and remote access of uh, our labs, it becomes important more than ever. Additionally, uh, incorporation of uh, cloud-based telecommunication technology within immersive media, such as uh, Microsoft's Dynamic 360, uh, 365 Remote Assist, which was incorporated uh, quite um, significantly in HoloLens 2, opened up opportunity for, collect uh, for uh, collective learning and remote troubleshooting, which we know it's a very big part of uh, any process that deals with uh, hardware and software simultaneously. Now, um, focusing on HoloLens, because currently that is the most advanced AR technology that we have available, um, this project, um, which was called Steampunk, uh, which was deployed for the 2019 Tallinn Biennale, utilizes hologram application uh, for HoloLens to create a user-friendly um, um, application to set series of guidelines for this process of uh, construction would require, in this case, bending, this plywood pieces, uh, steaming, assembling, etc. But the most interesting aspect of uh, this workflow here was the fact that the project managers were able to train the, the unskilled volunteers in a very, very short time. So here we just wanted to uh, highlight um, and perhaps the Be a point of conversation about importance of alignment of a virtual and physical spaces together. I think I got disconnected perhaps for a second. <laughs> so uh, here uh, we want to uh, again emphasize the importance of alignment and uh, alignment in uh, working in simulation space uh, to then begin to bridge the gap between virtual, virtual and physical. And um, Building on what was mentioned before, which was um, the advancements that are currently happening in field of cinema and um, media arts, um, again, uh, building on a previous uh, example of Box, uh, which was uh, done by Bat and Dali here, the, um, this, this film also used, used the Bat and Dali technology to then begin to think about how to create continuous shots that then simulated this um, different uh, gravity forces. So something that was not possible to do with existing camera rigs and VFX. So looking um, at interdisciplinary uh, collaborations and workflow becomes a very um, important aspect of pushing this research forward um, if we're interested in um, truly be, uh, becoming part of this conversation. Um, the third topic that we have uh, identified as a related field for discussion is adaptivity, or what we can call in the context of this presentation and following talks uh, in this panel, architecture as a robot. So the idea of adaptivity has a very strong precedent in contemporary technology-driven research and design paradigms. This in multiple scales is usually discussed under the terms and concepts such as reconfiguration, interactive and responsive systems, which can have different applications in the built environment, ranging from reconfiguration in large or urban scales for flexibility and customization, in the spatial design, as we may see in this conceptual installation by MIT Architecture Machine Group, or interaction and responsive design at the scale of the body of the building, furniture, or building components and elements in order to map and achieve reconfiguration in human scale. For instance, as we can see in pop-up apartment on the left or muscle tower in the middle, both by Hyperbody Research Group at TU Delft or an L uh, muscle installation on the right in a non-standard architecture exhibition at Pompidou Center in 2003. At the same time, beyond uh, the qualitative architectural capacities that adaptive systems can offer, we can think of different measurable performance criteria, such as structural design and environmental conditioning. For instance, in this cantilevered structure by uh, Gennaro Senatore, we see how uh, we can design structural elements as responsive robots, then radically reduce the material consumption and significantly improve the performance by embedded sensing and actuating control systems. 
or in this one to find a one to five scale model of room vehicle project by Greg Lee informed, where with only two rotational degrees of freedom, the whole room affords different configurations and scenarios to use the space differently throughout the day. The fourth and the last uh, topic uh, that we, could, uh, we would like to address is what we define as co-agency, the agency of both human and robot, which can be, uh, which can be radically changed and redefined through human-robot uh, interaction uh, in immersive, collaborative, virtual and physical environment. We can find examples of such co-agency in different fields and projects, such as in these works by Sugwen Chong, where artist and robotic arm are co-creating the art, which eventually lead to new forms of artistic expression, in this case, in 2D format of a painting, or in this project by Merit More, uh, we can see a more three-dimensional co-presence of both dancers in their environment. Or we can example, exemplify another type of co-agency in this project, tactile telerobot, telerobot hand, in which, in a very literal way, two six-axis robotic arms are mimicking the hand's movement, which potentially can augment individual collective individual or collective acting capacities of users in an environment. So to conclude, we think that uh, in the context of what we have framed as immersive robotic environments, and throughout this panel, we can further address and discuss different spectrums of concepts such as digital phys physical, sensing and actuating, perception and creation, and so on and so forth. To summarize, we are asking what are the affordances and limitation, limitations of such interdisciplinary efforts in practice, research, and education. When it comes to research and education, it is really interesting uh, uh, when we look at the statistics, for instance, in digital futures, as there is a growing interest in these two fields, even in the very current circumstances that we are all living in. Or in Acadia, for instance, recently, uh, we had these two workshops uh, that are related to the topics that we would like to address in this session, which both are led by two of our today's panelists, remote control uh, co-led by Johannes, uh, or the other workshop on the right by Ibrahim uh, uh, with a self-explanatory title, Augmented uh, Robotic uh, Telepresence. To start the panel, we first uh, uh, will have uh, um, Ibrahim Pustinchi uh, joining us from Kent State University in Ohio, then we move to Johannes uh, from University of uh, Arts and Industrial Design in Lin Linz. Also, he's from uh, uh, Robark Association. The third speaker of the panel will be Shaheen Vasir from Florida International University joining us today from Miami. And the last presentation will be by Madeline Aganon of CMU and Atonaton joining us today from Pittsburgh in uh, Pennsylvania. So with this, uh, we directly ask the first speaker, Ibrahim, to share uh, his slide with us. And while uh, he's sharing his screen, I will take a moment to introduce uh, Ibrahim a bit more to our audience. So I Great. stop sharing. Ibrahim, please uh, move on and share your screen. Uh, Ebrahim is an uh, architect, artist, uh, and inventor. Uh, he is an assistant professor of architecture and founder director of robotically augmented design Rad Lab at Kent State University in the uh, and the founding principal of Studio EP. He is the uh, inventor of two uh, patents inventions focused on creative robotics, and has served as a member of numerous scientific committees for multiple journals and conferences, including Acadia, Cardia, Sigurdi, International Journal of, of Architectural Computing, and Architectural Science Review, amongst others. So, uh, Ibrahim, please uh, start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sina. Um, can you hear me fine? First, I should double check. Very well. Yes. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, so, before we start, I think I quickly need to reshare since I forgot to add the sound. Um, but okay, it should be fine now. Um, thank you so much, Biana and Sina and um, Digital Futures, um, first for again inviting me and for having us. And again, thank you so much for really set on, setting up a, 
and really amazing and uh, exciting lineup. And of course, the topic is just um, you know self-explanatory. I think it, it's just um, awesome to be able to talk about such an interesting topic, um, you know, within the field and beyond. Um, so I'm I'm really excited to, um, you know, um, share some of the work that I think um, uh, engages me personally with the topic of immersive robotics. And of course, looking forward to hear the rest of the conversation. Um, as um, Sina mentioned. Um, Part of the Kansas State University, and I'm directing the Robotically Augmented Design Lab. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today, or the, or the way that I kind of curated the, the presentation today, is um, really more um, on a personal side of um, the engagement with the robot on, on kind of like, I wouldn't say humanistic. Uh, I mean, it's irony actually that it can be humanistic or post humanistic way. Um, so I call the presentation post-assembly line, line robots, and I quickly start with the very short reel of um, the work that I've been doing for a while, um, um, which, which kind of again looks at robotic systems and uh, ro technology at large um, as possible mediums for design thinking, um, which kind of started from um, more or less years ago during my time at UCLA with Greg Lean or under Greg Lee, I should say. And then um, basically that emerged from that conversation for further um, through my own practice and research as kind of more interaction-based, um, real-time, uh, collaborative um, slash immersive um, experience with robots through um, manipulation of the space or um, again, thinking about them as possible mediums for design. Um, and again, trying to push the boundaries a little bit in terms of how they can become or how, how can they engage in the design process beyond the, the fabrication or beyond the final step of um, kind of representational videography or so on and so forth. So again, from reconfigurable um, architectural proposals at the desktop scale all the way to, again, literally physically simulating the um, digital qualities out of the screen. Um, and um, you know, and some other projects that we um, see in, in a second, uh, and including uh, some proposals for uh, moving architecture at, at that time. So I'm gonna quickly pass this um, since again, I think it captured the, the essence of uh, of the work. And I have to confess right at the beginning, um, just so I put it in perspective, that um, the presentation today, um, until I kind of I regret saying this. Uh, is really going to be uh, coming from a perspective of a formalist. Um, so I think that that puts some um, uh, you know peace in the game and, and it just reveals a little bit of the the fact that um, these are coming from a formal perspective. But to again situate the uh, the work a little bit further into the disciplinary conversation and into kind of um, the research agenda that is being um, kind of the um, driver of of this project uh, with capital P. I think uh, I'm, I'm revealing some statements and then put them back together that um, it's coming from a person that is interested in digitalizing the physical and physicalizing the digital, meaning I'm not really interested in software or hardware. Um, where I think I'm living is right at the intersection or right, sorry, where I try to live is really at the intersection of these two. And I look at architecture as a medium for experience. So I think um, for me, it, it moves a little bit beyond the building conversation and it moves also beyond the non-scalar conversation conversation that is kind of more on the digital project side um, and i know that we really don't have a post-digital definition yet but i'm kind of um, looking more on the uh, second wave side uh, about about the building which kind of uh, goes through, through the experience and i read it through the ui ux scenario so i, I think so architecture can be an extension of the interface and um Tangible technologies um, can become intellectual intellectual vehicles for these conversations that I pointed out, and um, there is a potential for alternative reading of digitality and physicality and human machine agencies uh, through degrees of auto uh, autonomy, which is again uh, questioning the, the 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 fine line between digital and physical in in the current stage. But um, those are scattered um, statements, so let's let's put them back together. Just a reminder, it's coming from a formalist perspective. Uh, who is interested in digitalizing the physical and physicalizing the digital and uses architecture and the built environment as extended software interface and as a medium for experience, um, in this case UX. 
and using tangible technologies as a vehicle for this conversation through alternative readings of uh, post-digitality and encoding, um, again, yet to be defined, um, so many perspectives on it, and through human-machine and uh, human-machine interaction and human-computer interaction with some degrees of autonomy. <clears throat> so I, I, I hope that that kind of um, shows that it's a very, I think, curated and very small portion of what it can be that I'm going to present today. Um, which kind of leads or um, grows from um, some, uh, basically I would say topics or some interests um, that I'm gonna talk about. So one that I think, um, and these are not in um, really order in terms of the year, but I think it just put adds on uh, in sequence in, in, in the way that I want to talk about projects. Um, but one of them is um, that, that, that initiates this initiated this conversation in mind is um, one of the installation or group shows that we had at um, A Plus D Museum in Los Angeles, curated by Tony Moray and Yvonne Bernal and Ryan Martinez, uh, which um, it, it was basically a, a video projection um, project that uh, the curators asked us to kind of project on three architectural kind of um, figures, let's say, uh, the, the house and the, you know, the pancake and the tower. And, and the way that I, I approached it, it, it was really about a storytelling through the lens of a robot, as, as if the robot was kind of uh, playing um, or uh, kind of participating in a pool park. Um, I think, again, this one is really basically an animation-based scenario with some degrees of um, augmented reality, which I didn't show in the video and I'm going to skip. But um, I just wanted to briefly start with this project just to show that uh, I think my engagement with uh, immersive robotic topic is really from the perspective of um, storytelling and um, the robotic agency beyond the operation. Um, so it's really about cohabitation, I would say, or coexistence, um, which again, trying to see possibilities of how um, we kind of blur this hierarchical scenario of uh, again, I'm using the, the classical terminology, which I'm not the biggest fan, but like I'm um, slave master in computer science or, you know, in computer scenarios or even in robotics. So as a kind of like flattening that a little bit in the, in the light of the, you know, a lot of conversations we have these days about equality, about, um, you know, post-human philosophy, so on and so forth. So that project um, in the same year led into uh, one of the projects from um, some of the courses I was teaching at the time at Kansas State University, which looks at a similar thing in a little bit more immersive way. Uh, it's called Child, Child Robot. Um, it has kind of a sad story, I would say, uh, but um, it is really about a future um, family that adopts uh, a robot as a child. And, and it's really about the, the, the performance of that robotic, uh, and, and I'm quoting, the, the robot child um, and, and how it interacts with its virtual room. So it, in a way it initiates our project that looks at, and, and we have a couple of them, uh, the project that looks at um, kind of intersection of uh, robotics and augmented reality or XR uh, at large as extended reality, which is re really looking about the interaction of a physical existence uh, in this case, or physical existing element in this case, um, the, the robot arm and a virtual scene. Uh, and then the, the user really can uh, become part of the storytelling or become part of the setup by kind of, um, you know, uh, in, engaging spatially or visually. Um, the, the technology part is really, as you can see, it's extremely simple. It's, it's a tracking-based um, um, uh, uh, augmented reality scenarios. And in this particular project, we use green screen as a way to um, trigger the uh, kind of the, the virtual backdrop. And, um, and basically using game engines, in this case, um, Unity, uh, we were able to create um, and this is a kind of a real-time um, video of that experience um, uh, that that put together as a video. But uh, and that's part of it. And that's reality, like a screen record because it is a screen record. But um, we were using Unity as a way to synchronize the interactions and trigger the motions, um, you know, together as as possible interactive scenarios. So as you can see, that the robot is completely, you know, coming from the physical environment and the the conscious from the digital side and it's experienced through a hybrid, multi-layered, um, you know, system. Um, and now we are looking at it through the lens of the robot. Um, I think what I want to emphasize about this type of um, 
you know scenarios or setups um, and and we don't have I mean we have a lot of them actually it's not the only one um, I want to emphasize about the multi-sensory experiential aspect of them which is not really about um, a robot interacting with like a kit bash um, you know wall but it is beyond just moving back and forth and it's really about the multi-sensory where you can touch the robot where you can kind of hear the noise where you can feel the air that is being pushed away, so on and so forth um, from there. And I mean, that that same system, we started to use it in multiple scenarios. One of them that was published at, um, I think, iJack or a couple of other places, it's, uh, it's using the same technique to virtually fabricate or virtually kind of meal some pieces of um, foam, in this case, or 3D print based on the ex exact same setup. So the robot is physical. So we can test out the limitation and, and the material is virtual just so we don't um, waste the material to recognize the, the possible physical limitations of the robot, which might be imperfect comparing to the um, digital simulation of it. Uh, but we, I mean, in a more active way to our conversation of uh, immersive robotic, we use that more or less similar platform um, or I use it in um, two different workshops that one I thought at um, LSU and the recent one that has been mentioned at uh, Acadia this year. And I'm gonna talk about the one at Acadia, which is really looking at the similar platform of um, augmented reality slash um, robotics as a way to create, I would say conceptually create or propose a telepresence setup. Um, in this system, we were using a combination, again, of course, given the time that we are living at, we were using a real-time robotic controlling system um, and through Grasshopper and through just um, uh, sharing platforms. This one is the platform um, that enabled the participants to design the motion and to trigger the motion. So that would have become the, the way that we look at a presence in physical space broken down into two things. One is the demotion in the space, which is again uh, happening through this um, custom made interface uh, through the motion of the robot. And the other was through the manipulation of the space as another mean of presence. Uh, and that one we did through the use of augmented reality. So in, in, in short, uh, each participant or each group was able to um, modify the, the robotically augmented design lab at Kansas State um, through their augmented reality kind of um, objects or scenes. And they were able to experience it um, through the motion of the robot that they curated so they could kind of really walk through. And on our end, we were also trying to make it a little bit more um, kind of connected. So we basically had uh, the, the face of the person. I mean, I think it's a little bit conceptual at this point. But the, the face of the person that was running the robot um, projected on the monitor on the robot. So, so it, as if they were um, present in the room. So um, the whole um, workshop experience or the whole kind of, again, I'm quoting telepresence experience was really um, being live streamed. Um, so, so it was also trying to question the fact that if we are virtualizing or digitalizing some of these and we are uh, physicalizing some others, like meaning the, the presence and uh, modification that are half digital, half physical, um, how can we possibly share these experiences with more than one person? So the whole experience, as you see now, um, uh, was being live streamed uh, on, on a website host, in, in my case, in my website. And then um, that was enabling the, the other participants to also engage in the exact same process of, or in the exact same um, kind of experiential experience of the or a spatial experience of the, you know, walking through the uh, rat lab or manipulating the, the rat lab through again, AR scene or AR setups. Um, so basically I'm gonna kind of um, let this go a little bit, but basically um, there, there were um, conditions that, um, again, given the workshop setup, there were conditions that, um, you know, um, participants from across the world were, were kind of controlling our robot at uh, rat lab and uh, really kind of um, using the, the setup that we had uh, far from uh, behind. So again, just some diagrams of how it was uh, going. As I said, uh, the technological setup was really similar to the previous project using a trigger. Um, and then the, the control was happening through a, a, an interface of um, um, uh, that enables the uh, uh, participants to control it um, in real time. And 
um, really the, the, the way that the setup was um, set was really to kind of not only bring the feeling of exist, uh, presence to the participants, but also bringing their presence conceptually to our lab. And again, we had uh, controls from, um, you know, San Francisco, from um, Czech Republic, from like all across the world. So that being said, um, I think um, these are, um, again, we are slowly actually, if, if, uh, if it makes sense the process, we're slowly coming or emerging from completely digital experiences through the projection mapping at A plus D to slightly hybridized, to a little bit more hybridized. So I want to go back to a project um, that I've done uh, in collaboration with um, some of my good friends, um, um, Saleh and Marcus uh, at uh, Washington State University, where we looked at kind of bringing that digitality or pushing that digitality a little bit further um, uh, beyond just um, representational aspect of digitality and trying to convert or translate digital qualities into physical presence of them. So in this case, uh, it was a manipulative or uh, it was kind of like a flexible, I should say, um, mesh that, that was living out of the computer. Again, just as a surface project, basically, which can be unwrapped or wrapped in different ways. In this case, it's a sphere. And um, it was uh, triggered and animated by controlling it uh, to a cell phone application. At this point, it, it is and it was a, kind of a modeling interface for digital modeling. But as I said, it's a surface project, so you could easily unwrap and wrap itself back onto any architectural surface uh, project um, beyond, you know, beyond the, the, the formal or figural um, aspects of it uh, as, as a surface um, kind of detailed scenario. So I'm just going to quickly move forward just so we see. It, it was based on uh, linear actuators that we use really in um, a lot of places like parkings. Um, and um, here is a funny story about this that, I mean, just on a technical side that I was insisting that I'm not going to do this project unless we use 100 actuators um, because it's going to give the real flexibility that we want. And we really ended up um, using around 19. So I think that's also worth mentioning that uh, sometimes these uh, translations are not as smooth as um, they could be or they should be. And last but not least, uh, I want to uh, wrap up my presentation with a personal project, um, which I don't think would be categorized as a spatial, but I think it kind of amplifies the idea of uh, human robot um, Again, I, I don't want to say collaboration, but human-robot coexistence, uh, I rather say, which again, looks at, at the hierarchical scenario a little bit more flattened. So it's, it's a human machine, it's part of a bigger human machine interaction um, kind of research that goes on at Red Lab. But the, the question is really about, again, questioning this hierarchical operator-operated relationship to kind of make an improvisational setup for both the, the musician in this case, the, the artist performer, and the robot. So they are equally um, kind of affecting each other's performance. Um, in this case, the robot, and I'm going to play it. I hope that the audio kind of comes through. Um, but in this case, um, and I shouldn't really talk over it because it's really the, the dialogue that makes it interesting. But um, really, the, the performer um, or the musician in this case uh, myself uh, is really um, improvising based on the motion of the robot and the cues that um, that I get from the motion of the robot in another screen. Meaning, it just gives me a cue of how it's gonna move, and then I manage the tone based on that. And it's completely the other way around as well. So the robot motion is also completely based on the notes that it hears, on the tunes that it hears, the, the volume, the gesture, so on and so forth. So I think. Um, this kind of illustrates a little bit uh, of the coexistence that, uh, that um, uh, I'm trying to, uh, honestly, to trying to find a way to think about it. Either. Um, and uh, it's a long video, um, uh, so I'm going to pass on it. Um, uh, but, but it's one of my favorite projects in terms of um, the illustration of this coexistence and illustration of this cohabitation, uh, I rather say. And again, this was all coming from a formalist. So uh, forgive me if it um, really was not the other way around. Um, that uh, is again, looking at the bigger research of um, 
how the integration of robotic technology in art, I mean, art based or design based or design oriented setups can question the older relationship of um, uh, you know, robots and technology in, in design, especially in the light of this social, political, post human, philosophical climate of non hierarchical relationship to um, possibly open uh, possibilities for misusing rather than using. And then um, questions if mistakes, and I'm quoting, um, can be more useful and more desired than the program test. Again, as if we are like working with a collaborator or with a, a person beside us that sometimes the work that um, they're not supposed to do becomes inspiring, uh, become inspiring. And it's about really questioning that, um, again, uh, slave master relationship. And with that, um, again, I would like to thank you both uh, Bihana and Sina for the invite and Digital Futures for uh, hosting and looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim. Really uh, fascinating and interesting. I'm sure there are a lot of interesting questions and comments, but we move to the next presenters. Uh, Johannes. Uh, Johannes uh, Brahman is a professor for Creative Robotics at uh, UFG Linz, leading an interdisciplinary team of researchers towards exploring robots as an interface between the digital and physical worlds. As co-founder of Association for Robots in Architecture, Johannes is tightly linked with both the robotics and design community. He is the main developer of the accessible robot simulation and programming tool, KUKA PRC, which is uh, today used by more than 100 universities and 50 companies worldwide. Johannes, you may start. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you, Biana and Sina, for making this um, event happen. So I feel very comfortable, I think, in this group of speakers and very happy to be here. Um, maybe just a tiny addition to the introduction, uh, Sina, where you referred to the Acadia workshop. So that was really primarily the work of um, Ethan and Sven. So I think this is important to, uh, um, to note as well. So fortunately, the programming is not just on my side anymore, but there are more people now working, contributing, and uh, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that. Um, my presentation today to give a bit of an intro to the panel um, and kind of the, my approach to it um, is titled Collaboration and Robots. And usually when you think of um, collaboration and robots, you immediately think of collaborative robots. So um, this was a workshop that we did in Barcelona a while ago, but this is not really what I want to talk about today. I want to look at this kind of collaboration of um, human robots working together at a much more basic level. So um, the context of this slide is that we recently got a new lab in Linz, so basically in between lockdowns, so we did quite a few things of ourselves. And um, I kind of learned that if you build something, the level of instruction, of course, depends on your existing knowledge. So on the right hand, we have these faucet instructions, and they basically assume that you're a plumber if you want to install it. On the other side, on the left, you have these typical IKEA instructions that even tell you in which direction to tighten a screw. But you need to remember that you still actually need to know how the process of even tightening a screw works. It only shows you the tip, doesn't show you what's happening otherwise. And I think this is kind of a crucial point of um, machine and human collaboration because machines don't have any pre-existing knowledge at all, basically. So if you want to start um, creating machine to help you, you would really have to tackle many, many huge topics like mechanical system, hydraulic systems, kinematic safety, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a huge task. So this is why um, I really like industrial robots as a medium because they basically allow us to abstract the complexities of a machine and mostly deal with movement. Movement is still kind of, can be complicated enough, but it's already much more manageable than having to think of all those different disciplines. And this was also kind of um, our approach for um, KUKA PRC. I mean, there are many tools to program a robot. We said what we need um, for us is to think about how we can constrain this kind of tool path to parametric geometry. So basically, of course, the idea that all of you are aware anyway, this when we change the geometry, kind of the robot simulation immediately changes along with it. 
So this is useful for mass customization, but it's all also useful for teaching and for learning because it gives you this instant feedback. You do something, you see how it react, react you learn from it. And as the platform to incorporate that, we used um, Grasshopper because of the wide range of existing users. So now that we've got an interface that allows us to tell the robot basically what to do, does it really solve everything? And of course, the answer to that is no. We still need to have the process knowledge in the first place in order to define a process. And getting information to the robot means programming. And I mean, this is a very big reason why we like um, Grasshopper, because it opens up the process of programming to non-programmers. Um, so the direct interaction that I talked about before. So this very intuitive, trying something out, seeing what happens. I think this is very, um, fits very well this kind of creative ways that users um, of Grasshopper work. And we can, of course, then apply this to the robot. Because it's important that if you want to 3D print in large scales for construction, like for example, branch technology is doing with our software, you need to know 3D printing and also the constraints of the construction industry. The same applies to working with concrete. So it's never enough to know how to program a robot. You need to know kind of the process and then transfer that knowledge to a machine. So um, let's take a look at the project we did in a bit more detail. So um, that was, I think, like two years ago. And an um, event agency approached us and showed us the video, um, the automatic music video from Nigel Stanford. So if you haven't watched it yet, definitely do so. It's super nicely produced and they wanted to have something similar. However, now the real challenge is that uh, in a music video, you can basically show everything. You just have your CGI, you have cuts. So, um, but if you do it live, it actually needs to work on stage. So that's a big challenge. So you really need to think about what would be the way to um, realize that. And um, unlike Ibrahim, I'm not a musician. I've got no idea of music at all. So um, I was very happy to uh, um, work with my colleague Sander Hofstey on that. So he's a semi-professional musician. He knows very well how to play the guitar. And uh, the first thing we did, of course, was look at the process of playing the guitar. And obviously, it's the result of um, humans developing a musical instrument. So of course it uses the full capabilities of our manipulators. So basically it's a 10 finger process. And um, of course there are robotic hands around. We talked with Shunk a little bit. Um, the price wouldn't have been that much of an issue. We would have get, gotten that one for the event, but they're just much too slow. And using 10 robots at the same time isn't really an option anyway. So you can't, I don't think you can easily fit 10 robots around the guitar. Would be fun at some point, maybe. So basically for us, the approach was now really to flip that around. So not trying, um, how can we play the guitar um, like a human as a robot, but actually go the other way around that we said, well, Sander, now you only got two fingers. How do you use your two fingers to play a guitar? So basically um, what Sander did was that he started developing or compose a music based on just having kind of two fingers as his tools and then use that knowledge to um, develop the, together with us, of course, the 3D printed end effects where we have this dampening instrument, then the plucking instrument. So, you know, still don't know anything about guitars. And um, yeah, so then we had a kind of idea how we can approach that process from a purely mechanical side. As the robots, we knew that we wanted to be as fast as possible. The rule of thumb with robotic arms is that the smaller the robot, the faster it is. So we got the smallest ones from KUKA. So they can just do three kilograms of payload, but they're pretty fast for that. Um, but the next challenge was really, how can we get Sander as a guitar player to program two synchronized robots? So this is kind of a complicated process with all these aspects of timing of, um, so this is really not, not a small task. And um, Sander is an industrial designer. So he had a very good idea about um, Rhino. He had worked with Grasshopper before, but still this is kind of programming wise, it's super complicated. So what we came up with instead um, was just to use a notation system. So the same way like you abstract music as a musician or as a composer is that we created a purely um, 
geometrical system basically in Rhino. So he would draw different kinds of geometries assigned to different layers. The X axis would define the um, timeline, which, in ti which in would then also set the synchronization and so on. So Sander only had to interact with a graphical system. And then we had a system on a grasshopper side that would transform that into the KRL code for the robots. And then, of course, there was a big amount of troubleshooting because um, simulating or predicting the times of robotic arms is quite complicated. So this was then really about trial and error. But he was then just able to use the normal um, kind of rhino mechanics of dealing with geometry. So if you need a bit more time, you just stretch it, you move it around. So that was an intuitive process. And um, then we had the kind of the simulation setup. And then uh, finally, we did this in front of a couple, I don't know, thousand people, I guess, in Geneva in Switzerland. And because you can't really have two small robots in front of a thousand people, we mounted the um, two small robots in turn on a big robot. So it gets some kind of um, stage presence. Of course, we also humanized it a little bit. So there was a little bit of choreography. Um, kind of interaction and then we had it actually play live. I mean, the sound that you hear now is not synchronized to what the robots are actually doing, but it really wasn't big. So that was something that we very much enjoyed. But of course, playing the guitar is kind of a um, tricky process. So for some reason, we keep getting back to music because it's an interesting field. So um, that was at this year's um, Ars Electronica Festival. And here we used a different kind of interface. So we didn't have to use complex notation, but it was a collaboration with Ableton and they have this touch interface board. And the nice thing about it is that you not only get where you hit the button, but also you get how hard you push it. So that was of course then kind of a big value. And we then used some, um, let's call it AI system because it sounds nice to then turn the kind of samples that people programmed and turn it into a repeatable loop that was then exhibited live outside. Um, on the background, we didn't use a um, grasshopper because this is not really that good for this um, stuff. So I worked with Amir Bastan, one of my researchers, and he um, used uh, V4, which is a very nice visual programming tool if you're looking at real-time data. Um, another very direct interface to get process knowledge to the robot is um, motion capture. I mean, it's not an easy interface as we're going to see, but for the person doing the motion capture is very direct and intuitive because this is what those people do. So that was done in collaboration with uh, Silke Kradinger. Um, she's a professional dancer, worked I think for Cirque du Soleil and similar companies. So um, very well known and a very great person to work with. So um, for that project, again, for Ars Electronica 2019, we first started doing the motion capture at the um, Ars Electronica Future Lab. And the nice part about, again, using the tools that we have on hand was that we were then able to immediately provide her with feedback by not just using the OptiTrack system, but then also using a Kinect connected with Grasshopper. So that she as a dancer got this kind of immediate feedback, what kind of action, um, what kind of reaction her action causes with the robot. Um, then the reachability, you already see this is kind of complicated. You see some red parts. So we then also utilized some built-in systems like Galapagos to optimize the placement of this kind of um, skeleton frame to the robots to find a semi-optimal solution and then to um, visualize the entire process. So you see that we have a big robot, uh, 500 kilogram, I think, Fortec, um, doing the kind of global motion. And then we have four robots each responsible for a joint that's then um, performed in real time, perfectly synchronized. So we didn't um, then stream that directly from Grasshopper, so that would have been problematic for some technical reasons. So basically we prepared the data, we was processed it in Grasshopper, and then we put it on a pack back of PLC so, um, that was communicating with the robot then in um, hard real time. So basically at the deterministic millisecond. And I think this is 
kind of now a big value that we can change from different environments so quickly. So um, we have our kind of fundamental logic, but then we can really adapt to the individual requirements of a process. So this is just something playing around with in that case in Unity. So we have the same kind of logic that we have in Grasshopper or other systems. We can then put it very quickly in the browser. And then because uh, mixed reality was mentioned, we can then of course also put that um, on a HoloLens and play around with the robot in real time, which again, for some people is a very haptic and nice interface. So I very much enjoy working um, with the HoloLens about having this kind of possibility to interact with this kind of digital twin of the robot. So um, basically to sum itself up, I think we're going to see more and more robots in our environment and in collaboration with humans. And as software developers and also educators, which I think um, fits to um, the people in this group, I think it's important to consider that every group of users has its own focus and interests. And I really believe that domain specific interfaces are the way to go if you want to inverse a maximum of users in robotics. So we don't try to have this kind of one, th one thing fits everyone, but we try to accommodate to the individual interests of people. So thank you very much. And I'm very much looking to the following presentations and the discussion. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, and uh, our next speaker uh, today is uh, Shaheen Masir. Shaheen, whenever you're ready, if you could share your screen, please. Hello, hello everyone. Great, so um, I'm gonna uh, introduce Shaheen uh, and uh, please uh, start sharing. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, my colleague Shaheen, who's a professor of architecture and associate dean of research and faculty development at FIU's Department of Architecture. She's uh, also the co-director of structural and environmental uh, technologies lab and the robotics fabrication lab. Amongst many, many publications and achievements, perhaps the most relevant one to today's topic is Shaheen's research, recent National Science Foundation grant, which was a million dollar grant to evaluate the automation needs of the architecture engineering industries and develop an AI power training program in partnership with several national and global industries. Uh, please start uh, whenever you're ready, Shane. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this event, which has been very interesting <clears throat> so far. I hope I can add. <laughs> so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the potential of the AR and VR, immersive environments for learning. <clears throat> and that's actually what I have been researching uh, in, my, in my academic life. Um, so recently, the research has shown, and actually it's proven that immersive technologies can improve learning. AR and VR are being increasingly used for training in many fields, like medicine, a range of businesses, army, and so on. Uh, for robotics training, simulations in AR and VR can engage students in the learning process and reduce the risk of physical harm and damage, which is a real concern. Two features of these technologies, <clears throat> immersion and interactivity, are actually very exciting and bringing new, new, instinct, new vision to how people learn. Um, immersive, immersion can be designed to develop experiential learning where knowledge is produced through experience. Interactivity can facilitate experimentation, exploration, and feedback. <clears throat> Interacting with an environment where the learner can modify the content of learning and their, you know, provide their own input can improve performance. Another technology which has become a commonplace is artificial intelligence, which is now incorporated to many, many aspects of our lives. Um, although the use of AI in teaching and learning is lagging behind, it's growing fast. One of the most promising implementation of AI in education is the new advances in what, what, in what they call adaptive learning systems, which includes deep learning, natural language processing, and computer vision. These systems are developed to dynamically adjust the level or type of instructions based on the learner's ability or preference in order to customize the learning. 
the possibilities of adaptive learning systems become really more exciting and interesting when they're integrated with AR and VR or immersive learning, where the system can collect data from the learner's activity, interactions, uh, performance on a continuous basis. Introducing advanced sensor technologies, another level takes it to another level. It's <clears throat> in this combination, this combination allows more effective way of evaluating performance based on the student's biometric, uh, which is gaze, heart rate, brain scans, and body in bodily engagement in, in the environment. The ultimate goal is to provide feedback to the learner and guide them through the learning process. There are several educational theories that state um, learning is effective, is most effective when the learner understands their own activities and their own weaknesses and um, strengths. So building on some of these uh, ideas and technological advances, uh, we got together with a large group of faculty, the interdisciplinary group of faculty at FIU. Uh, and the faculty were from architecture, computer science, engineering, construction, and neurosciences, and wrote a proposal to develop a learning environment to teach operations of the industrial robotics. We proposed to develop uh, something we call the, in the Robotics Academy, which is a cloud-based, intelligent immersive platform for training the future works of, workforce of architecture, engineering, and construction, AEC, for robotic automation. This was actually a call that they wanted us to address the industry. So we kind of put, uh, put our efforts in that direction. So in fall of 19, 2019, we received a grant from NSF. Uh, it's called uh, a program called CXL, um, Convergence Accelerator Program to research, basically it was, a, it was the, um, the proposal was written to research and develop a plan for the Robotics Academy. So the Robotic Academy platform, um, we, you know, we designed um, to have three different branches. The immersive learning, uh, which, is, uh, which I will spend most of my time, my remaining time to describe, and the two other branches are innovation network, which is an AI supported roboticist forum for problem solving and networking. Um, the other one, the marketplace branch is mostly a job, is, a, is an intelligent job match, um, matching system, which actually uses AI to match employers and employees. In the research and uh, design phase of the project, which actually the funding was for, we did uh, several activities. We, we actually looked at industry, uh, industry analytics. We examined, uh, we looked at different papers, what is happening in the AC industry. We hosted a summit with uh, several um, very well-known people in this area. We interviewed business owners, roboticists, educators, and industry workers. I think we interviewed Johannes, who was just presenting before me, and that's how we got you know, acquainted. Um, we looked at user testing uh, of a curriculum. We developed a prototype that I have a video I can show it to you at the end. And uh, we did, uh, we provided the AI uh, system architecture uh, document. So this is a document that, you know, allows us to follow um, the, 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 compu the computing aspects of the project in order to make it happen. Okay, so we interviewed, I'm going to just talk a little bit about this. We interviewed 18 people, which helped us to understand uh, what are the needs? Um, we learned that uh, trained people are hard to find. This was contrary you know, um, to what we believed. Um, before we, we thought that you know, in the train, you know, there are a lot of trained people who could do this. Then you know, we learned <clears throat> people actually learn differently and they have different preferences for learning. So some, someone might not enjoy learning in the VR and AR in, environment. And for some people that would be the ultimate experience. Um, so uh, we also looked at, at the training material and we learned that the training material are scattered and scared, scarce. So there are not many places that people could go and learn about this, learn how to operate robots in a more effective way. They would be like, you know, they have to go to different places. Uh, 
So we decided to offer an immersive learning curriculum in four formats. So I just want to take a look at this. You know, these are some of the excerpts from the uh, from our um, interviews. So for one of one of the people say it was uh, just trial and error, trying to learn, making every possible mistake, consulting forums on the internet and databases to try to get as much as information as I could. So we figured out if we can find a comprehensive place that you know people can access this information, it would be very effective. So we looked at our um, virtual uh, reality uh, and AR lab, uh, which is, provides interactive, uh, interactive, uh, interactive and um, learning system for learning machinery systems and robotics. Uh, the remote lab actually students program and operate an industrial robotic arm hosted at FIU's lab. Then the open media lab actually provides online courses, workshops, videos, and animated simulations for diverse learners. And there's also a, an in-person training in this <clears throat> process. Um, so integration of AI and VR actually in our plans, in, in our research provided um, several advantages for us. It, it allowed us to develop simulations of real world tasks, provide object, provide for object manipulation, uh, add audio and text input from, uh, from the learner. We, we, use, we work with Microsoft Azure to help us do this. Then uh, also audio and text output to guide the learner and customized curriculum, which would be basically selected by the system recommender that we design. So it, this also allowed us to look at the, to develop a learner's uh, profile uh, which accommodates for learning styles, learning goals, and time commitment. So if, if, you know, a learn, if AR and VR was not the best way for, you know, for some learner to, to understand the material, we would send them to the, <clears throat> to the workshops and to the PowerPoints and more traditional, traditional ways of teaching the same lessons, which we have it on the, uh, which we are developing on the website. And the curriculum uh, would be designed based on the profile information and the learner performance as we can look at the learner performance on a continuous base. This would help us to kind of provide the, the curriculum and this will happen automatically on the fly. So the curriculum design actually uh, was interesting because we learned that we could not have like a long lesson. So we had to think about our lessons as very, very small units that could be actually threaded together to make a larger lesson. Um, then I, as I spoke, we delivered in multiple formats um, and providing instructions. And then we looked at biometrics and actually I know was, you know, really a champion for that. And uh, we did, we worked, uh, we worked with different headsets. And basically the only thing that we were able to gauge was uh, eye gaze. And we're hoping at the next stage of the process, project, we can, we can do more on that. Um, so the content of the curriculum that we were able to test it were these the, in three areas, computational thinking for robotics, process safety, uh, and parametric design, again, all in the, in the uh, realm of robotics and robotics operations. And then robotic arms, which actually we talked about beginners, intermediate and advanced. And we have plans for teaching different, um, how to connect different end effectors and a lot more. So what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna show you the, a basically snapshot of the prototype that we have designed. So this is an environment that you can, you can enter and select the lesson um, based on what is being recommended to you. So you have a profile, the profile is kind of recording your um, many different aspects of your activities. So we are thinking that you're gonna be able to do this. We haven't, you know, as far as heart rate, we haven't done that, we haven't tested it, but the, you know, all of the other, most of the other ones are, 
already in this um, prototype and are working. So you could actually put your input um, with uh, take, uh, texting or audio. You could um, you could select the course, look at you know, or and look at your progress. And this is an, a little animation of what might you see during the lesson. It will tell you what percentage is completed. So this is actually for access lesson. You can manipulate the robot in this environment. Now we're working on a pick and place lesson, which is almost completed. So we're doing it little by little, very slowly. It's a very time consuming, very, very difficult task. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Shaheen. Um, going to continue by introducing uh, Madeline. And uh, Madeline, if you could start sharing your screen, that would be great. So I'm also very honored to introduce uh, Madeline Gannon, who uh, is also known as the Robot Whisperer. So she's a multidisciplinary designer forging new futures for human-robot relations. Her work shows how blending art with technology can create better ways to live with machines. Madeline is on a mission to make robotics and other advanced technologies open, accessible, and interesting to as diverse uh, an audience as possible. She's a research fellow at the Carnegie Mellon Studio for Creative Inquiry and leads her own research studio, Atonaton. Uh, Madeline holds a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University and a Master's of Architecture from Florida International University. Very honored to have you, Madeline. I'm so excited to be here and just to like, take a moment to just highlight the Florida International University representation on this call. It makes me very, very proud as an alumna, um, both with you, Bianca, and Shaheen, who's been a mentor and friend of mine for a decade now, decades. Um, and also a connection to Kent State, where, where uh, a, a classmate of mine, uh, Ivan Grinnell, is a colleague of Ibrahim's uh, and the chair of the School of Architecture there. So I couldn't be prouder to have been associated with FIU and I am incredibly jealous that the students have a robotics curriculum now, because that, that didn't exist when I was there. Um, but my journey into robotics really did start there when we got a crazy futuristic machine called a 3D printer and a CNC router. And that's kind of where I tasted the, the first experience of getting all of my digital creativity out of my head, out of everything that I was being taught to 3D model and into the physical world. And that, that taste was intoxicating and it led me down a wild journey that is where I stand now, kind of in the realm of robotics. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about, um, let's see. I'm gonna talk a lot about robots today, but it's a really an overview. And so what I thought, um, uh, these projects are in further detail um, on my website. But I thought I would just talk about a little bit about how I approach robotics from the point of interaction instead of automation and a little bit of, of my agenda um, for, for how I see the impact that architects can have in bringing robots into society and helping design how we cohabitate uh, and, and live amongst each other. Um, this is a project that, that uh, we are fortunate enough to take out of the lab and into a cultural space, the Design Museum in London where I brought a one ton robot off of an assembly line in Birmingham, UK, and gave it a six month holiday to live in the design museum to just hang out and greet people and, and check them out and just kind of exist. Um, and a lot of this work that I do is fundamentally using these machines to do things that they were never intended to do. So take something that was designed to do short repetitive tasks over and over again, give it eyes into the world and let it sense and respond to the people around it. Um, I've been able to work in a policy context as well uh, with some work in junction with the World Economic Forum um, as a cultural leader and as a council member on the Robotics and IoT Council. Um, it's been really important to take these ideas and put them in front of policymakers who are actually going to begin to decide how this technology interfaces with society. So this was an invitation from the World Economic Forum to create an installation 
that can help people during the annual uh, summer Davos, but help people think about this new future that we're entering into with Industry 4.0. The idea that intelligent machines are cohabitating a space with us and they have autonomy, that they're not entirely um, under our direct control anymore. And what we give up in control, we gain in connection. Um, and so this is 10 industrial robots, all sharing the same central brain and responding to each other, not as machines, but as almost like a pack of animals. I work a lot with um, sensing systems and software. My, my medium is, is really in, in the software interface. And taking my training as an architect and our hypersensitivity to how people move through space and translating those sensibilities into these big, giant, dangerous machines. Um, and that has a lot of consequences that I think are applicable to a lot of the more um, newer types of robots that are entering into our world. Um, so if you think about something like a self-driving car, like an industrial robot, it's big and fast and dangerous. Um, so we can explore a lot of the human robot interaction uh, challenges on a more mature robotic platform by just doing these tests in, with industrial robots. I, I think it's really important to engage with communities outside of architecture and outside of design. We have a role to play. You know, if you think about, if you think about computing, if you think about robotics in general, it's a discipline that's at best 50 years old, you know, at best. And maybe if you go back to Charles Babbage, maybe it's a, you can extend that history out a little bit, but it's a 50 year old discipline. Architecture on the other hand is half a millennia old of knowledge that's been passed down generation after generation after generation of architects about how humans experience space. It's an amazing well of knowledge that needs to come into technology realms, it be it in software development, be it in robotic development, any aspect of technology that interfaces with society, that interfaces with the public, I feel that you architects need to be at the table. So I'm, I'm so happy to be here, part of this group uh, of people who are engaging in taking our knowledge out of our field and really engaging society. And what a lot of this work that I do, it, it, it's about abstracting away all the complexities of working with these machines and finding opportunities for these, these alien creatures that don't look like us and don't act like us uh, to connect with us in ways that are not just useful, but also meaningful. When you think about the relationships in your own life, um, you don't think about the ones that are like pragmatic and useful and uh, you, you care about the ones that are meaningful. And so as we begin to live with these machines side by side, um, that's the future that I think that we need to work for and begin to experiment at the edges of what's possible. So the end goal of this is really to show uh, that there's more opportunity than just control, that we can also use connection as a way to interface with, with these machines. Since this is digital futures, I want to share my, my favorite diagram of the future. This is from a futurist called Stuart Candy, and it's about the possible, probable, and preferable futures. So if we're standing in the present and we're looking out into the future, the cone of that begins to grow as you look further and further out. And the way that I like to see this is that industry really focuses narrowly on the probable. And research has a wider vision to focus on the possible. And where the arts come in is really at the edge that pushes at the edge between possible and impossible towards the preferable future. And that's where I try to live. That's where I try to explore and, and map out new terrains. Um, my next adventure uh, is I'm actually standing in it. Um, about a year ago, my, my husband and I we bought a warehouse in Pittsburgh and uh, we're turning it into a warehouse house. So uh, uh, the next big adventure is actually to not just focus on better ways to communicate with machines, but actually better ways to live with machines. 
So we're moving in with the robots. Um, actually, we have one. I have one right here right now that I've been getting out of hibernation and back online uh, out, of, out of storage. But really, you know, I've, I've thought about after my PhD, thinking about how do I want to impact um, the world? And, and for me, my goal is really to live in the future and begin to explore the new terrain that, that we're going light speed towards and report back some of the interesting findings of what it feels like to actually live with robots. Um, so this is a this is a living laboratory and an artist studio that will hopefully be able to uh, host other collaborators in here as well. Um, but uh, but it's been pretty exciting to to take this uh, century old warehouse and kind of excavate it a little bit into a live workspace uh, so that myself, my husband, and our one year old daughter can grow up around machines. Um, I'm, I'm so excited for the conversation and uh, again, like an amazing panel. I'm so enthralled with all your work. I've known all your work for a long time. So it's, it's great to put uh, faces to the work as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll hand it back over to the moderators and hopefully we can get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Madeline and everybody. Uh, all the panelists could turn on the camera and we can begin the conversation. So we do have a few questions that are coming in, but um, um, we thought that perhaps we can start uh, with the general questions that we can ask everybody on the panel. So um, we opened this panel by highlighting uh, history and, and possible trajectories uh, for this field. Um, which uh, it's not really, uh, I think for most of us, we're trying to uh, operate within this interdisciplinary uh, environment and mad your diagram that you uh, showed uh, the space between industry and research and, and art is pretty much, I think how most of us are operating, whether uh, in a sense, part of it is uh, in robotics in different departments. And, and I think this is something that uh, especially as faculty or as, let's say, uh, PhD scholars is something that we uh, have to kind of maybe initiate ourselves, right? So uh, in a sense, uh, all of you here presented uh, your research interest uh, and focus, but I'm curious uh, if we could uh, maybe go one level uh, more uh, deeper because uh, there's certain trends that are uh, emerging in industry, and then we each have our own research interests, but uh, every so often uh, there's uh, certain design imperatives and certain, uh, let's say, uh, circumstances that, uh, uh, that happen. Um, the obvious one, uh, current situation with the pandemic, and also, um, let's say, depending on where you are, uh, environmental crisis, et cetera. Um, and also uh, economic, uh, uh, let's say, imperatives. So I'm just curious for each of you, what are some uh, design imperatives or what are some urgent issues that you're trying to address while you're trying to navigate in this interdisciplinary field um, and kind of manage teaching and research? Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I think for me, I, I think a lot about labor and the future of work. Um, the, these things are, are it's a complicated issue that, you know, robotic automation is, is something that is incredibly powerful economically for efficiency, for safety, but it has such a huge impact on uh, people's lives. The, the real impact of, of robots coming in is that people lose their livelihoods. And, um, Part of what, I, what my interest is in, in these machines is that they're really a symbol of our fear of obsolescence of technology. And so I try to work with that and play with that and show that there are alternative visions and that our march towards automation is not a force of nature. These are choices that we make. And so engaging in policymakers is kind of this, this new territory that is a completely different language that, that I'm learning a lot in. Um, but it's really where I sort of see the impact of being able to change minds and being able to change systems that affect everybody's lives. 
So yeah, I think just to quickly follow on um, what Madeline said, I think for me is also it's about um, you know cohabitation and co-living with machines and trying to find the kind of optimum in between, uh, both in a disciplinary way and honestly on a um, non-disciplinary like personal life scenarios. So going back to you know the the, the historical conversations, I think one of the really intriguing um, um, you know conceptual scenarios about robots that always kind of is exciting for me in a negative way actually is um, the Carl Capex. Um, you know, writing or a screenplay of Roboti, which is literally the, the initiation of the term, uh, which in that sense, because there is a hierarchical kind of social um, distance between the, the robot group, which is the, the worker, um, you know, um, the, the level of the, the society conceptually and, and the, the others, they become rebellious and so on and so forth. So, so I think that vision, which we carried it on uh, for, for maybe a little bit too long, um, you know, which, which with industrialization and so on and so forth, of, uh, you know, use of machines as 24-7 workers, that, that's the part that I think is slowly and gradually shifting and changing and probably should shift not only, you know, of course, um, not only, but uh, for social political reasons, but I think just because of the fact that we need to find a way to coexist in a little bit more non-hierarchical way, just as a way that we can collaborate, as a way that uh, it, you know, there, there is no boundary like such anymore. Again, given the fact that I think it's coming anyways, so it's just better to be friends with them <laughs> rather than, you know, trying to make this um, hierarchy. So, so for me, it's again, just a double of what Madeline said. I think it's really about um, the finding the new ways of um, coexisting really and trying to learn from each other, trying to enjoy the, the I wouldn't say new norm, but uh, enjoy the new emerging norm maybe. If I could follow up, you know, the, the metaphor of command and control is not appropriate anymore when you have robots that have autonomy, when they can think and make decisions for themselves. So even when they're doing a simple task, say you, say you, you pick an app and, and you order some lunch and a little Starship robot delivers you lunch in a cooler. That is a transactional relationship between you and the robot. But because that robot is in public space, it's impacting so many other people that didn't ask for you to have it impact their life. And so as soon as you take these robots out of the lab and into the wild, we need to begin to have better ways of, of interacting with them that are, that are equitable, that are just, and that don't have these unintended consequences that, that people just kind of raise their hands and, and shrug at. Um, you know, if, if, a, if that robot breaks down in the middle of a crosswalk and someone in a wheelchair can't get out of the road. You know, that's something that's happened here in Pittsburgh uh, multiple times. And, and these are really the consequences that, that um, as, as people who operate both in culture and technology, we can begin to surface and poke at and offer alternative visions that if you're working inside industry, you might not have the headspace to, to look around and explore. Maybe I can add something from, from an education perspective. I think um, future of the workforce uh, is really important. And for us to be able to have our students to be participant in that and not just kind of being, you know, as in a uh, uh, in sidelines is really critical. I think that's why we, you know, we were thinking about the project actually, Maddie, you were a big part of the project as well. But it is important that, you know, we as architects, you know, see upon ourselves, maybe we can actually push, push forward with this in a way that we haven't pushed forward with anything else. Because, you know, we are in a good position. A lot of people are doing a lot of, a lot of experiments. If we can, if we can make this kind of go to students and expand and learn, it would be amazing, amazing skills for them to have when they enter the workforce. Now, whether it's like in five years and four, 10 years, it is something that, you know, they're going to need. And the more savvy they are about like automation and working with robotics and AI, I think they, they're in a much better situation to actually look at their jobs because, you know, the, the advances of AI is changing, is changing the way we work. And um, it is it, it's going to replace a lot of jobs. It's going to create new jobs, but maybe our students are the people who are going to kind of be a part of, you know, people who are taking the new jobs rather than, you know, losing their jobs. So I think this is really important for us to think about that. 
And it's not just about employability in my mind, it's also about empowering with this knowledge that gives, gives students the ability to invent new markets, right? The, the gateway to, the, you know, the gatekeepers to, to industry are kind of uh, out of out of the question when you're able to wield this technology in such a, a savvy way. So being empowered with that education is a huge step for that. Actually, let me just follow up on that. One of the things that we learned in our interviews, it was actually from, I think we heard it from a lot of people, maybe even Johannes, that a lot of the you know, students, their students, uh, the educators, they are actually going to entrepreneur, uh, they, they become entrepreneurs. So they, they don't stay in architecture. They have a robot and then they go and make, you know, make shop. And then they basically, they come with new inventions. So this is really interesting. If our jobs, if architects jobs are going to be threatened by AI, machine is going to do the design, then we can do a lot, a lot more with, you know, with the same, you know, with the same technology. So I think a core aspect is really but to make people aware of the possibilities that they have. So I think um, with all kinds of technology, you often have the problems that people see it as something that's unobtainable. This is abstract. This is something that only other people could do. And I think this is really a core that needs to be kind of, um, I mean, people need to understand that machines are not necessarily that clever. So they're clever as we make them do things. But um, I think this is really, they need to understand of the stuff that is possible. And I think these um, um, also installations that um, we've seen also, especially in Madeline's work, I think this is important to really get people exposed to machines just to see that they can stand stand around um, everywhere, that they this is not something that is something to be afraid of. And something that I kind of liked from the argumentation is that we um, did many projects with KUKA and um, I like the hardware, but I can't say that they're definitely better than other robots. But what I liked was the kind of mindset from them when they kind of at some point told us that um, they think um, through the kind of stuff and projects that we're doing, both in architecture and construction, but also in art and communication, um, this allows them to target the decision makers. So usually their marketing is targeted at the engineers. So they want to put robots in technical schools. They want to put this to um, not necessarily even universities. So they would on targeting more this practical education part, but they said now this is kind of an opportunity for them to target decision makers. And I think this is a good kind of mindset to not limit yourself to the people who use it at the moment, but to kind of expand to people who will use it at the future and need to be aware of the possibility that it offers. And just quickly to add, I mean, I, I probably know probably we have more questions, but just to quickly add, because um, it's a really exciting conversation, I think um, another thing about this is the difference between accessibility and availability. And, and I think that that brings up also a really important question of um, interface, right? So, um, you know, the, the question of how people would communicate or interact with these uh, you know, existing platforms or these uh, possible possible new ones that are coming. So I think what is really interesting and exciting about the, all, all the work that we saw today uh, is really the fact that um, we are all looking or seeking possible new ways of communication as well as, you know, looking into the machine itself. So it's not necessarily the software, it's not necessarily the hardware, but it's really the in-between um, that, that defines the relationship or defines possibly the, the, or basically takes the availability of the machine and makes it accessible. Um, I, I think that that's also very um, intriguing and exciting that is emerging from these conversations. And I think, um, you know, the past, the past almost year now, we are really relying on simulation as a way of increasing accessibility and simulation and game engines, which, you know, dots kind of all of our work, both in the education space and, and the practice space, you know, when, when I, I didn't have 10 robots to develop that installation that was in China, I had two in, in Pittsburgh and I had to just use simulation to, and, and a little bit of trust and faith that when I got on site, everything would just work together. Um, but that's a new reality. And I think it's a huge, huge opportunity for more people to get involved. And yes, it's wonderful to stand in front of these big beasts of machines, but when you can't, you can begin to have uh, proxy experiences through VR, through AR, uh, through mixed reality, through just you know traditional simulation, 
and really begin to explore in a safe sandbox these new experiences. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful discussion and wonderful presentation. So I also would like to thank everyone. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, discussion also going on. I would like to um, ask uh, all the panelists, how do you see the way we can assess our works in the field of uh, uh, architectural robotics and creative making? So I think this is a very uh, tricky question. If you think about it, like for instance, uh, Ibrahim started his presentation by saying that I'm a formalist. But then uh, throughout his presentation, he was mentioning that beyond form, beyond the surface, beyond um, basically the, the, the visual, uh, let's say, uh, aspect of what we are doing, there is, there is some ideas behind what we are doing. So I, I wonder in, in multiple scales and levels, how can we uh, sort of assess the impact and success of what we are doing, for instance, in the, in the scale of the work that, that Shaheen was uh, showing, um, um, maybe, maybe our, uh, uh, I and also we as, uh, as moderators are interested to know how we can assess and, um, the success of uh, such a large grant uh, and, and what are the measures to, to, to sort of evaluate that. Um, so I would like to, all the uh, pa uh, panelists sort of reflect on the way they, they sort of assess and evaluate their, their, their work. Great. I think that's a great question, Sina. First, thanks for asking that, because I think I should have mentioned that what I mean by formalism is really the Russian formalism. Uh, so it's a way of uh, looking at existence through the presence of form. So it's um, not necessarily architectural, which goes against functionalism like in, in a binary. Uh, so it's more like um, the, the, the existence through the presence and uh, the formal presence. But, um, but I think that's a valid point and I'm not, I'm not really concrete on um, honestly, and I don't think I would ever, and I don't want to be, to be honest, uh, concrete on any of these definitions on an on the ideological side. Um, I'm really looking at them from the provocation outside, you know, like just as a way to, um, you know, um, activate some of the thinking. But, to your question, which I think uh, is a super interesting one, um, I, I, I think for me it's really similar. I mean, at least um, on my end, I'm really looking at them, as I said, as interfaces or mediums. Um, so I'm really, from disciplinary perspective, I'm really looking at them as extension of our digital design environment. Uh, so I'm leaning more towards the UI side of it uh, and a little bit of a hybrid UX uh, rather than uh, just like thinking about it as a I mean, of course, I, I have done some projects, which I, I think I didn't present, hopefully I didn't, but uh, that are looking into like an animated built environment, so on and so forth, which is really on the robotic building side of the, the architecture. But, uh, but again, currently it's, it's more for me about the possibilities that some of these active agents can bring into the design game. Uh, I, look, I often look at it uh, similar to the early years or early decades of um, digital design, like the first uh, move. Um, and, and the way that the, it, the, the digital software was being approached uh, by duplication of, you know, what they've been done before until they started to kind of like maybe like uh, Greg and, you know, like the, the, the question is, uh, started to begin about, you know, can we use it as an, um, like, a for, again, I'm encoding like form making um, system, can we use it as a way to rethink the way that we think about design, so on and so forth. So I think now it's a physicalized version of that. Um, um, scenario. So for me, the robots are really, uh, because they're restricted with physicality and at the same time, because they think through a digital medium and they become this really interesting hybrid creatures. And, and I, I'm quoting Madeline on that. Uh, and kind of Yvonne, honestly, Madeline, he uses creatures a lot as well. Um, um, and then and, and see what they bring to the game in terms of inspiration, in terms of the conceptual, um, you know, uh, the projection, so on and so forth. So for me, it's really on the medium side and and the conversation about how it how it may affect the the design itself, uh, both on a conceptual level and ultimately uh, physically. Well, maybe I can pick up on another part of your question, which had to do with assessment. So, how do we assess the success of the project? Was that what you were kind of asking? That you know, how do we assess if if what we are doing is successful? So there. I think for, for, for me, what I had to do through all of my, you know, all of my academic years is that I had to come up with like a criteria of assessing that success. So one of the things that I think is important is like, 
what is the we have to know what is the impact of what we are doing on people so for for projects that are designed you you know we we look at you know how the design is being used how people are responding to it for educational environment what is the student student doing in that environment what is their performance um for robotics like what maddie is doing you know just survey of people like okay what does it make you feel or how do you you know what this interaction means to you so i think just to measure the impact on people could be a way of assessing you know how you know the direction of the project and how successful we are because that is a good gauge it has been a good gauge for me and it's very difficult to do because you have to finish a project you have to have a product you have to have something working 100 before you can actually really gauge its impact realistically I sort of feel, um, I sort of feel, so, so out of all the panelists, you know, I'm, I'm not teaching in a, a university. I'm, I'm affiliated as a research fellow, but um, the, the assessment and the reporting back has to fit within a certain criteria when you're putting together your tenure package. And I'm in a fortunate position that I don't have to abide by, by those constraints. Um, and so where, where I look to impact, I look to impact in, in a number of different ways, but um, I sort of look to how my ideas spread and how many more people are joining in this kind of interesting territory that I've, I've been sort of trying to explore and, and make, a, make a road behind me so that other people can come along. And so if you think about architectural robotics and a lot of the work that Johannes has done, in making these machines accessible and easy to use for, for architecture students. The past you know, 15, 20 years is really focused on fabrication. And now you're seeing a shift into many more dimensions of exploration where we're looking at interaction, we're looking at experiential, we're looking at immersion, we're looking at um, al alternative technical interfaces for this. And that to me is, is, is really exciting to see the diversity of exploration that's coming into our field um, is sort of what, what I feel proud of, of helping to make it okay to do kind of non-normative explorations in architectural robotics. From my side, maybe what I really enjoy, I mean, I'm obviously, I'm coming from architecture. I wouldn't call myself an architect, but this is my background, basically, what I what I learned in a certain way. But what I actually now really enjoy being at uh, at an art university. So UFG um, is an art university in Austria, but I'm heading a um, research department with about 10 um, researchers. So it's a very unusual situation, but I very much enjoy it. And I think one of the reasons is that um, I don't really have um, a study program, like a master's program. So basically all the students that end up with us, they actively want to do that. And because we manage, we talk about how to assess success. So I think we, um, this is really what the students do out of this experience. So um, we have now quite a few startups and this is really stuff that I think I'm actively proud of. So these are people coming from fashion, these, these are people coming from um, industrial design, some of them from interactive media, and then they take the jump to actually get their own robots, build up their own um, business out of it. Because something I think that we know from robotics is that it's everyone can very quickly make a nice kind of prototype or video, but getting something to work as a company or as something that is reliable, this is very different. And I think this is really a core step to um, have people who do these steps. And I think this is for me kind of one of the ways that I would assess the more people uh, uh, we enable to do this step, um, yeah, the better and the more I enjoy that. Great. Uh, we have also a lot of questions in the in the uh, in the chat box that maybe we can start uh, addressing some of them. Uh, one interesting one comes uh, which connects to uh, culture, ideas, and policies. Uh, Madeline and Shane, thanks so much for your uh, presentations. Please elaborate about the components of cohabitation and education in the co-evolving field of architecture, robotics, UI, and you. X and AR and VR, can, uh, how can architects push the fields of the sciences forward 
what are the existing uh, senses that architects poses? How can architects now redefine culture, ideas, and policies? I think that's a that's a, a broad question, but at the same time, I see a lot of connections with what you were showing in your presentations. So feel free to to take the take the take the question. Maybe, maybe I can address some of it if I understood it right. Uh, so the the question is that how is that we can kind of architects can push forward in the direction of science, and I think I think the time the time is now and it's working for us. So from my own success, which I could have never dreamed that I would get a million dollar as an architecture faculty. Um, in an area that is really not recognized in NSF. That was like, you know, wow, I, I, know, I was like really surprised that we were able to, to do this. So I think the time is now and um, doing big projects, doing our small projects and kind of developing them to bigger and bigger, bigger possibilities, I think is possible now because now um, the federal government and the National Science Foundation is actually giving, you know, giving, thinking about like funding architecture projects. They weren't doing that like 15 years ago. Um, so I think that is one, one direction that, you know, make projects. And I think that is very fundable. Like when you talk about science and technology, I think every project that, you know, I saw here could have like potential for, fund, for funding. So I think that is something that we can push and you know, and get get it funded because this is stuff that takes money. Like I, I'm not a technologist, and I couldn't do any of that, you know, without a big group of support. So I think that's what is needed, and I think time is now. We we might be able, you know, we might we might be able to lead this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. If you if you look at things like um, UX UI, oftentimes there's a lot of spatial aspects to that. If, like, of course, VR, uh, AR, MR, these are all spatial modes of computing. And who understands space better than architects? Like really no one. Um, moreover, a lot of the tools to engage in those areas are things that we're already trained in. So they're game engines, which is you know, a 3D modeling tool. So all the ingredients are really right to master these new territories and offer unique value to society. I think a, a, lot of the, a lot of the roadblocks is that in architecture, we often only talk to other architects, right? And we need to sort of be more vulnerable in sharing our vision of the future with a wider, wider audience. Um, and the challenge is this, right? So the, the clock is ticking. If you look at, if you look at the, the major tech companies, they're already exploring the, the messy world of, of the physical space. So you think of like Google and Sidewalk Labs doing urban design and urban planning in Toronto. Um, they oftentimes will hire architects or WeWork as well is another great example of someone who hired a lot of architects and integrated verticals from fabrication to installation to interior design. So if we as a discipline don't begin to claim this territory, it's just gonna get eaten up by technology companies that are, you know, through trial and error, computer scientists are learning spatial design for VR and AR, whereas we already get that from, from the jump being in architecture. So that's my kind of like call to action to make a thing and put it out there. It's, you know, it's just as simple as that. Let me just talk about one thing, you know, just add to one thing you said that is just coming out of our own discipline. I think like everybody has, you know, talked about the importance of interdisciplinary uh, collaboration, but it wasn't possible. Again, I'm older. It wasn't possible 15 years ago when I went to engineering department, they didn't even consider like architect, you know, what do you want to do with us? Or like in computer science, but now they need us because you know they need us like in a way never ha in, they have never before because they need ideas they need these ideas to be implemented they can they can write the code so collaboration with computer science is like you know i think is really really vital with with any any with any area with arts and but i think that again the science area the science uh, group are listening to architects again like never have before you know 
it's like, for example, this project we did, we have like full professors, computer science, full professors as co-PIs. I mean, they would have never come as a co-PI on a project before, but you know, this is kind of proven that yes, you know, you know, we are in a good position as a, as a field. I mean, I love the conversation, so I, I have to um, kind of jump in as well. But um, I think it's also just, I mean, I 100% agree with uh, what has been said. I think it's also just the, the value of design at large that is becoming more and more culturally active in the game. Um, so, I mean, I think we, we kind of passed that um, era of um, fetishizing the technology, right? So it becomes more and more like a normal exist daily based thing. So, so I think... Uh, with that being said, um, uh, to the question about you know the justification of um, like moving the science forward, I think it might be kind of now the time to change the currency in a way, or at least there is a possibility for changing the currency in terms of like what values the project, uh, and uh, and I think we see that often more and more in in, in platforms or in institutions like again NSF as has been mentioned by Shaheen or you know, other like um, robust existing uh, kind of well-known scientific uh, oriented, so, science oriented um, kind of institutions that are adjusting their, their definition of uh, recognition, that are adjusting their definition of valuable. So, so they are changing the measure as well. And I think that's not um, necessarily because of the, the fact that, um, um, you know, so, uh, they, they kind of um, need us for their work. I think it, it is really the, the, per the perfection or the kind of uh, the, the design that really is becoming one of the additional layers that, that is now game changer or definer. Uh, I mean, one kind of cheesy example, honestly, uh, would be the Apple products, right? Uh, so uh, I think what is seller uh, for a lot of graphic designers or, or just like the public is really the design of it and not necessarily the back end coding and, and kind of the smoothness. So I think it becomes more and more a, a daily desire now that we pass that um, you know, fourth generation of industrial revolution or we are within it. Um, so, so it becomes the, the question of the other, right? So, so it's not in, anymore the fetishizing, the fetish, fetishization of uh, you know, um, the, the technology itself. But uh, I, I want to just also put something forward because um, I think um, I think everybody on this panel um, is practicing what uh, we're preaching. But maybe um, maybe we can reflect on also some of the challenges because we do know that it is quite challenging, um, especially when it comes to um, let's say uh, facilitating uh, resources. And uh, one of the realities is that um, if um, we do want to put our work out there at some point as, uh, as uh, academics, we also need to think about publication. And I think publishing within architecture around is quite different than uh, you know, venturing out and beginning to, let's say, submit to IEEE publications, right? In order for, uh, let's say, our work to, whether it's through collaboration or whether through us leading this initiative uh, for us to be at some point uh, kind of reach a certain standard, we also need to take these steps. And that does not come uh, maybe uh, easy. It requires quite a lot of practice and extra effort. So I was wondering if you can reflect on that. Um, because um, it, this is absolutely something that uh, is never mentioned, uh, let's say, in architectural education, uh, even in PhD level. So uh, if, uh, if there's any input there, it would be fantastic. Thanks. It requires a lot of rejection as well when you start to publish at these other domains. Um, part of the challenge of engaging in new communities is understanding what they value. And compared to what your home discipline values. And, and even like the language that's used is, is very different. Um, a challenge that I faced in, in publishing at a, ACM uh, conferences is that architecture writing is horrible. You know, you're never really taught how to write properly. Uh, and and it's just, I had to take years to unlearn kind of like the architecture language and just be more plain and like say what I mean. It took years of unlearning to, to get to that point. 
Um, but to, to Shaheen's point in collaborating with computer scientists, oftentimes like my, my first publication uh, was in collaboration with, with people that are renowned in the HCI community. And so they were my shepherds through that whole process and they were very patient with my horrible writing. And it's sort of like on the job learning uh, basically for, for that. But I'll, I'll let other people chime in. I think that's the best way of getting in, you know, just collaborating with others. And it's just not, you know, it's not just computer science. And just one, another thing, they're as bad as in writing as well. It's not, they have their own shortcomings. We talk, we talk a different language. We just talk, you know, amongst ourselves. And somehow we understand what you're saying. <laughs> Outside us, no one knows what you're saying. But, you know, I have worked with engineers and computer scientists they talk in a different way too that it's not really clear but i think just you know getting together at the initial and i think also the, the the academia is putting a lot of a lot of values now on interdisciplinary articles which they were and you know for tenure and promotion they didn't even used to count that oh you're not the same you know you're not the single author on this and but now you know actually at our own university it was just some memo that came down that they actually want like collaborative writing Now I can probably only just double what has been said. I think um, the rejection is the key, apparently, and, and collaboration, of course. And, um, and I think, um, again, I, I think it's also emerging the other way around, too. So, so I think that the receivers are also becoming a little bit more um, open to, to kind of different ways of looking at the same problem. And I honestly see that also in disciplinary conferences with the computational orientation as well. So I think some of the themes or topics in recent Acadia's um, that are focusing on, uh, you know, theory, for instance, uh, was something that was really missed for years, you know, like in, in this kind of like def definitive uh, way. So, so I think that the, 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 the culture of interdisciplinary is also uh, growing its way into some of these venues um, as we are adopting as well. So I think it's a mutual kind of um, movement from both ends uh, towards each other in a way. Maybe just a quick addition from my side. I think what I really enjoy about working with robotics is that it's such a big field that there is no discipline that knows it all. So basically you're forced to collaborate and people in this field are also kind of used to collaborate. So I think that makes it much easier. So there's no this kind of clear hierarchy that they know everyone and we're kind of trying to get there, but it's kind of clear that everyone is contributing something. And I think this really facilitates collaborative work compared to maybe some um, other disciplines. So for example, now we have a research project where one part is um, biomaterial. So basically the robot kind of growing structures, bacteria, sensor-based, whatever. And we find out that it, it's challenging to collaborate with the biologists. So they're great teams. So this is a very good research project, but at the same time, it's much harder for us to contribute something meaningful because it's such a different field. While with robotics, obviously, it's a bit more, just from a technical point of view, it makes it, I think, easier to collaborate. So I think that also allows this kind of, um, yeah, initiatives to grow, which is a really good thing. Great. Uh, so as we are almost getting uh, close to, to the end, I would like to uh, uh, ask some some uh, final questions from our panelists. I have a particular question uh, for, for you, Hannes. You, you were mentioning in the closing slide of your presentation that, that you think that we have to actually go more towards domain specific uh, kind of applications. While, uh, when I see your work, this this um, uh, open source KUKA PRC programming language is is quite generic, right? So how do you how do you, how do you think that that, that uh, we can we can um, um, let's say um, go for uh, generic applications which which we can uh, apply them in different cases and and at the same time. Uh, be as specific as possible, which which somehow also connects to this idea that 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 Madeline was uh, bringing to the table, uh, this 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 fine line between possible and preferable. So maybe in the uh, in the in the realm of preferable, we we may need somehow ad hoc solutions to to solve something in a creative way. So how do how do you how do how do we 
uh, sort of um, judge, uh, let's say, um, the, the applicability of our tools while you're saying we, we need to be case specific, but at the same time, um, like the way we, we see in the application of your, your tools, Kuka PRC. So it, it is opening a lot of possibilities and a lot of um, uh, engagements because it is a very generic tool. So how do you reflect on that? Maybe first, Johannes, and I would like to also hear from Madeline uh, what she thinks about it. So I think this is one of the strengths of architecture that is just so, such a wide field. So any tool you make for architecture, chances are good that it will find applications in other fields. That can also be expanded to the greater scope of um, CID software, like um, Rhino is obviously very popular in architecture. Um, we have some nice collaborations with Adidas, and I kind of assumed that they were using uh, Rhino just to run a bit of Grasshopper and maybe Kuka PRC, but it turned out that Rhino is their primary design tool that they use, um, coming from a very different field. So I think this kind of um, kind of speaks it that um, generic, um, you don't, maybe you don't intentionally um, design something as generic software, but then you really start to find out the new um, applications and other fields also try to find, um, realize all of a sudden that you're um, tackling pro um, problems that are also applicable to them. I mean, in architecture, obviously mass customization is a big thing because we don't have the budget to manually um, build all those prototypes. So we need to automate, we need to um, get efficiency because it just couldn't be done otherwise. But at the same time, of course, this is something that now in industry is also getting more and more relevant. And of course, those companies, and Matt mentioned that they, are, they look at the market, they observe, and then they, of course, also try to adapt um, those new technologies to themselves, which I think is a potential on the one hand, but of course, in some fields can also be something that's not entirely um, positive. So um, for us, as I said, Puka PRC was kind of, it grew out of our own research. So we didn't have a target audience. So I never developed the software for someone else than me, to be honest. So now this is something that's good for me to see that people find use. And this also then develops with my own interests. So at the moment, there is more getting into this kind of real-time networked um, collaborative thing. So whether, to be honest, the musical stuff, this is an offshoot. I really enjoy that, but this is kind of the proof of concept how to work it. But I think this is getting there. So now we're also pushing software a little bit in, in that direction, which then makes it useful to other fields again as well. Yeah, I think to Johannes's point that, that you know, a mark of success of Kuka PRC is how many other people are using it out, outside of his own practice. You know, it might have started as a tool for, for your own practice, but because it's written in a generic way, it can be adopted and manipulated and taken into many different directions that, that I'm guessing you probably didn't even anticipate. And yes, and for education, we are using that. We are using that to, to design the environment, the, the VR and AR, so, yeah. Let's do a little, little clap for an amazing tool. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, I, I contribute to, in the past, I've contributed to open source hardware projects. I contribute to open source software projects. For me, um, it's, it's incredibly difficult to maintain software and to make it good. Good design software is, is incredibly difficult. And so the tools that I make, um, I'm a little self-conscious of because they, they aren't as generic as they should be for other people to use. Um, but I posted anyway, I shared anyway, because that's how I learned how to do this stuff. Kind of to like a slide that, that Shaheen put where like the robot operator comment was they just went through forums and, and tried to figure this stuff out through trial and error. Um, that's, that's kind of how I learned. And so I like to one, participate in a community that is incredibly welcoming to newcomers, but also leave breadcrumbs behind for other people who are interested and enthusiastic and curious to begin to pick up some of the tricks that I've learned and I've used. And I feel like that's a good way of, of helping sort of raise the bar of our, of our community to do more impressive things faster and better and easier.
Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think this is a conversation that we can continue uh, forever, but um, I, I think uh, it would, we want to wrap up the panel so then uh, we're able to uh, perhaps in the future come back and have a continuation of this conversation. So on behalf of the Digital Futures team, uh, Sina and I would like to sincerely thank our panelists, Johannes, Madeline, Shaheen and Ibrahim and our audience for spending your Saturday with us. And we're hoping that this would be one of many conversations that we will have with you since uh, as we open the panel, uh, the topic is extremely broad, it's extremely nuanced. It's uh, constantly expanding and we know, and I think we believe that it's important and relevant to this conversation. So uh, cheers to great research and collaborative work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That was great. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.